Today, the White House said that Israel will begin daily four-hour pauses in its military campaign in the Gaza Strip, amid growing pressure to allow more aid to get into Gaza and more hostages held by Hamas to be released. While speaking to reporters today, President Biden also said there is no possibility of a Gaza ceasefire. It's an answer that Americans are increasingly rejecting, including Americans who work on the Hill. More than 100 congressional staffers participated in a vigil in front of the Capitol building Wednesday, calling on members of Congress to support a ceasefire in Gaza. President Biden continues to face pressure for restraint after his full-fledged support for Israel and its right-wing government. It's a dilemma that exploded into the headlines when a veteran State Department official in the bureau that oversees arms transfers resigned in protest of the Biden administration's decision to boost military aid to Israel. In his resignation letter posted on LinkedIn on October 18th, Josh Paul wrote, quote, we cannot be both against occupation and for it. We cannot be both for freedom and against it. And we cannot be for a better world while contributing to one that is materially worse. I believe to the core of my soul that the response Israel is taking, and with it, the American support both for that response and for the status quo of the occupation, will only lead to more and deeper suffering for both the Israeli and Palestinian people, and is not in the long-term American interest. And Josh Paul joins me now. Mr. Paul, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I would like you to say more. Um, you said we cannot be both for occupation and against it. What do you what did you mean by that in your letter? So I think and thank you very much for having me. Sure. I think what discriminates uh, the United States from the global competitors that we have from our adversaries is our values. And when we look at a context, for example, like Ukraine, where we are supporting what I believe to be a just fight uh, for sovereignty and for safety of civilians, uh, I, I think we have an important case to make there. When we turn around, on the other hand, and support the bombing of civilians, enable the bombing of civilians, uh, I, I think that undermines our credibility. I think it undermines our values across the world. You know, when Russia bombs hospitals, we condemn it as a war crime. When Russia takes out the power grid of a country, we condemn it as a war crime. Uh, but when Israel does it, we provide the bombs. Let me uh, talk about a little about your background. You came in in 2012 during the Obama administration. You stayed through the Trump administration. Uh, and uh, I read in the, the, the New Yorker piece about you that you actually had a letter of resignation ready to go um, and didn't feel ultimately that you needed to use it. Um, what specifically about Biden's policies caused you to use it now? So arms transfers are morally complex, often challenging, often set of wicked problems to which there are good, no, no good answers. Uh, but in my time in the State Department, I was often able to feel that I was making a difference, raising concerns, working with others to address and mitigate the worst possible outcomes of our transfers. What was different here is two things. First of all, it is the context. Uh, what we see in Gaza is a humanitarian catastrophe, and we knew that we were providing arms into that catastrophe. We continue to do so. The other thing that was different was when I tried to raise these concerns, as I had previously in multiple other cases where there were human rights concerns uh, to be thought of, to be addressed, uh, I was met on this occasion with silence. Uh, there was no opportunity for debate, no opportunity for discussion, no opportunity for mitigation, simply direction to move forward. Uh, as part of your work, um, for a time you lived in Ramallah, uh, which is in the occupied West Bank. What did you see and hear there, and how do you think the West Bank is being impacted by what's happening in Gaza, from your point of view? So in Ramallah, I was part of a U.S.-led uh, organization, the U.S. Security Coordinator, that is there on the principle that if the Palestinian security forces can stand up, the Israelis can stand down, and we can have a two-state solution. That's not how it worked. Uh, I repeatedly saw, of course, on the day-to-day -day basis, the humiliations that Palestinians suffer um, and the expansion of settlements, the expansion of settlement infrastructure, uh, continued incursions by Israelis into Palestinian homes and schools and territories. Um, I think that, you know, what is happening in the West Bank now should be deeply concerning to all of us. I think there is a great risk of destabilization. We have seen increasing settler attacks, and we have seen Palestinian villagers, many of whom have lived in their villages all their lives, being forced out in the last few weeks. This is the great unreported story of the current conflict in, Ga in the West Bank and Gaza. What do you think are the differences, having served in the administrations of three presidents, um, President Biden, President Obama, and Donald Trump, are there differences in the way these three presidents have approached this situation? 
Uh, yes, and also, of course, I served in the uh, George W. Bush administration. Right. Um, and I think there are, there are small differences, but I think we have walked ourselves into a bit of a corner. Uh, we have assumed that the direction we were taking, the path we were on, was the only one that would work. And what it has led to, unfortunately, is not security or peace, neither for Palestinians nor for Israelis. It is a moribund policy. And yet we have just dug deeper, as we continue to do now, rather than stopping and asking ourselves, is this working? Is this who we are? Is this who we want to be? You've had the opportunity, uh, because of the, the tenure and the timing of when you were um, in your job, uh, to have experienced Benjamin Netanyahu. He has been, for 14 of the last 16 years, uh, the leader of Israel, the prime minister. Uh, do, do you see in his actions any commitment, ultimately, to solve this the way I think most people logically understand it must be solved, meaning a two-state solution? No, and I think we have to be very cautious when we talk about Prime Minister Netanyahu, because his interests are not necessarily Israel's interests. Uh, when he calls for arms, when he decides to launch a military campaign, uh, we must remember that he is a prime minister facing indictment uh, with his own political skin on the line. And I think we have to be very cautious about separating out what is truly uh, in the interests of our partners and what is actually in the political interests of their government. What would you like to see President Biden do differently? And have you heard from the administration in any way or anyone from it since you've resigned? So I think what I would like to see President Biden do is call for a ceasefire. Uh, the U.N. Secretary General has called for a ceasefire. President Biden has called for a humanitarian pause. And I think there's something quite Orwellian, if you really think about it, uh, in the sense that a humanitarian pause is four hours out of 20, where there are not bombs dropping in one specific area. And by calling for a humanitarian pause and by Israel implementing them, uh, the president can point to this and say, look, we're making progress. We're making humanitarian progress. Uh, and at the same time, continue to supply the arms that are causing damage and devastation the other 20 hours of the day. So I think a ceasefire is the number one priority. And then to your second question, I've heard from so many good people across this country, but also in this administration, uh, on the Hill, all of whom are finding this incredibly difficult, uh, both for policy reasons and for moral ones. Josh Paul, uh, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, your experience is very instructive for all of us to learn from. Thank you. Thank you.